So our topic today is hostas, and I'm sure most everybody has grown a hosta, but we'll try to share a few things that you, you may not know about hostas. Uh, hostas are regarded as one of the best shade plants, and that's sort of where their claim to fame came in. But hostas in reality, uh, in the wild, grow in sun. They're not shade plants. They actually grow in the wild among daylilies, which is sort of interesting, uh, sometimes up above the tree line. And many times where we saw them, the daylilies and the grasses, the spikes will come up and that provides shade during the summertime. It's not from trees, it's just from other plants growing around them. Now in the wild, virtually all hostas are green. And if you saw one in the wild, you'd say, why would I ever grow that? But over the years, breeders have been able to take certain traits, finding one with a little bit of blue or a little bit of streaking in it, and be able to turn those into something quite amazing. Now, hostas in the garden today uh, always prefer morning sun to very light open shade. Hostas do not like deep shade. They are not good deep shade plants. Also, they're not good dry shade plants. They do not like dry shade. They can take it for a short period. But if you give them dry too long, the next year they'll come back up stunted, just little bitty pieces and almost dead. So they really do like it uh, in some morning sun. Some hostas will actually take some afternoon sun. And generally that comes from one set of genetics. There's a hosta in China called Plantangenia, and that is the most sun and heat tolerant hosta that exists. So if you look behind you, this big clump of hosta, that is one that is hybridized with Plantagenia. That's one called Old Faithful. So Plantagenia genes give you that sun tolerance, give you that heat tolerance, and also anything crossed with that will have fragrant flowers. That's the only way you get fragrant flowers in a hosta is to have the blood from Plantagenia in it. Now you would say, why doesn't everybody put that in it? Well, all hostas, bloom at generally from 7 to 8 a.m. they open. Plantagenia doesn't open until 4 to 5 p.m. So it's a little hard to get those two to cross. So that's why we don't have more of those, but that's been something that uh, we spend a lot of time working on. All right, let's go, let's walk a little bit and we'll look at some more. Blue hostas all come from really one species, and that's a hosta suboldiana. That is a, a Japanese plant, and it's from very high elevation. So over the years, the breeders have, have crossed that with itself and got really nice blue hostas. Typically, they don't live down here. They just, blue hostas don't like us. The only way to get a blue hosta in the south is to actually cross it with something that's heat tolerant. And there are a fair number of those that are out there. When they do that, though, generally the leaves lose that really nice puckering and size. They're still nice and blue. Uh, our goal the last uh, really about 10 years has been to breed a blue hosta that keeps the large leaves and the puckering that loves heat. And so this is our, our first uh, plant we'll be introducing in a couple of years. So we've been able to cross that with something heat tolerant and then back cross it slowly without losing the uh, blue color in the size. Now, a lot of people know hostas that are variegated. And variegated hostas are very interesting. Those are caused by mutations in the leaf layer. Every leaf on a plant, hostas included, have three layers. Layer one, layer two, and layer three. It's really fancy terms. Mutations occur in layer number two. And when they do, that's where you go from a green hosta to a variegated or a streaked hosta. It's a mutation, and mutations is basically a cancer. Now, not all cancers are bad. Some cancers are good. So it is the same type of mutation in the chloroplast that would cause us to be ill. In this case, it caused the plant to be worth a lot more. So that kind of mutation we actually like. There are many different types of variegated hostas. Uh, they go from uh, uh, center variegated to edge variegated to streak variegated. Uh, they're really, streaked is the unstable form. So when you buy a hosta that has streaks all through it, it's probably not gonna stay that way because that's the unstable form. Eventually all hostas with streaks in the leaf will go to an edge or to a center. Now, the other interesting thing that hostas do is hostas leaves change color. Hosta leaves are all either viridescent or lutescent. So in this case, the leaves come out 
with a white edge and age to a yellow edge. So they get duller. This is called viridescence, which means the essence of green. It, it, it goes toward green. There are some hostas that come out really nicely variegated and by summertime they're completely green. That's just a viridescent hosta. Others are lutescent. They come out, especially some golds, solid green in the spring and you think you got the wrong one. But then as it ages, it gets brighter. And then there are other golds that come out brilliant yellow and by July they're almost green or certainly chartreuse. So pretty much all variegated hostas change, some more so than the others. So you always need to be careful when you're buying to, to know if you have a hosta, if you're going to put it in a, a yellow garden and it ages to white, you probably want to know that. Uh, also, when we propagate hostas, something very interesting happens. The leaves uh, go back and become what we call juvenile. So for example, if you looked at this, this hosta right here, as the leaves age, they get more corrugated and more round. If I was to go in and divide that hosta down, and I could get probably 20 out of that clump, and grew that back out next spring, the leaves would all be pointy, and they would lose all the corrugation. That goes back, it's going back to a juvenile trait. And it takes it then two to three years to become adult again. Which is why when you buy hostas in a pot, they often don't look at all like they would when they're mature. So any hosta that has a big, wide, corrugated leaf, when it's old, it's going to look probably more like this when it's young. So a lot of people think they get the wrong plant, and it's simply a maturity issue. Now, you hear a lot of things that blue hostas like more shade, yellow hostas like more sun. Not true. There is no rule like that. Some blue hostas will do fine in sun, some blue hostas like shade. Same with gold. There's some gold hostas that will burn in sun, there are others that are fine. So it's not as simple as just picking a color. It's specific to that individual cultivar. Now hostas also do something very interesting. When they flower, which the earliest flowers are generally going to be May around here, they flower out of the center of the growth. Once they flower, that rosette dies. That rosette does not live any longer. But something interesting, at the base of each hosta leaf, if we were to, and I probably, I'm not going to be able to get you to see that, but if we were to pull this leaf all the way down and off, at the base there is a tiny little bud. It's a new plant. So every leaf on every hosta has a baby sitting and waiting at the bottom. And generally, those babies are not going to grow until the plant flowers. Once it flowers, it sends a signal that says, main stalk getting ready to die. Babies jump out. And so all the babies then start growing. So if you watch a hosta when it blooms, once the flower finishes, you'll see little bitty baby plants start coming from those dormant buds that have been sitting down there. So as, as, as plant people, what we're able to do is we can actually go in and cut the base. We can actually go in with a knife. So let's just say our hosta isn't growing fast enough. We can go in and take the knife, and we know the bud's right there at the base of the leaf. So we go in sideways to that, stick the knife all the way through the plant, and cut down through the roots. And when we do that, then we just pull our knife out and walk away. And then about two months later, all the babies start coming out. So we have done the same thing as flowering would do. Uh, flowering sends the hormone down there, the auxin hormone, and says, okay, go ahead and grow now. We basically severed its spinal cord. So now it's the same thing. It's like, all right, we're free, let's grow. So that's a little trick that a lot of hosta people will use. We call it crown cutting. And you can, you can take one plant, and you'll get anywhere, depending on the plant, from three to five plants out of that, out of a single division. So if we were really greedy, we could take that one up and just do a normal division, pulling each piece apart, and have 20. Then we could cut each one, so we technically could get 100 plants in one year out of a clump like that. So it's really quite amazing what you can do in terms of dividing hostas. Can I ask a quick question? Please. would be different than... Digging the plant up and dividing. Correct, yes. Doing this in the ground. You can do it in the ground, you can dig it up and put it in a pot, either one. Okay. 
if we uh, if I had one that was uh, if I had a shovel with me I could actually show you um, let's see if I've got one I can easily get out of the ground uh, that, uh, yeah, I bet we do hmm. come on out of there okay all right okay so at the base of each leaf if we pull the leaf back and pull it down see at the bottom there that little piece that's the baby bud where right there oh, that, that teeny little, tiny... little piece okay. that's the new hosta just sitting there waiting Aww. and it's not going to do a thing <laughs> until we force it to i don't see where the little bud okay is. Right, there. right there right there right there that little white thing and so what we're going to do oops excuse me is we're going to go in and cause it to grow so we will take our knife and we're going to go in right beside it and stick the knife all the way down through the plant coming out the other side and then we will cut right down through what's called the crown okay and then we just replant it and so all the dormant buds then will start to grow so it's a little secret that you can buy one plant and you can produce lots of them now each subsequent plant will be smaller and see we've left the top together so when you repot it or put it back in the garden it looks it just continue on growing but it will also have these new babies coming out one for each leaf is that one per leaf yeah, you have one one baby bud at each leaf. Is there a good time to do that? Uh, really, any time. Uh, you don't want to do it when it's going dormant. That would not be a good time. But any time, as long as it's actively growing, you can go in and do this. Some people do all kinds of things like putting hormones on them for rooting. I don't think you need it. I've never never used it, but some people do and swear by it. So, so you're jumping the gun after yeah. after flowering. This would yeah. happen. This would happen naturally. Exactly. So in terms of timing, mm -hmm. you did it before flowering, or mm -hmm. is there any advantage? Or? Not really. Some people just want to speed things along. They're just in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. Me. Nursery people, nursery people always in a hurry. They want everything fast. So it, it does work. I mean, some plants that are very small may not flower for two or three years. So it's not every hosta flowers every year until your clump gets big. So if it's not going to flower, this is a great way to do that. Now, hostas in terms of size, everything comes from the parentage. So the one I showed you in front, the blue one, is based on a hosta called Seboldiana, which is one of the larger hostas. So when you see something like this in the background, this is a large hosta that you pretty much know that's got hosta Seboldiana in it. Uh, whereas things like this look very different, and these have uh, a nice red stem. The red stems are all from what we call the rock hostas in Japan. They actually hang off the cliffs in Japan, and the red, and often you'll see white backs on them, and that is to reflect the heat. So anything that's going to have red stems is probably comes from that lineage. And those never have round leaves. Those always have pointy leaves. So again, anything you've got with a pointy leaf, you can pretty much, once you know the species, say, well, that's got A, B, C, and D in its background. Then breeders began working on dwarf hostas and trying to get them smaller. And this really came from about three species. Uh, uh, the most common is one called Hosta venusta, which is tiny. And that's actually the most recent species to become a species. It's native to an island off the south coast of Korea. So it's only about 15,000 years old. That's really young in terms of plants. But all hostas that are small came from one of those three. So we first got them to this size and then have eventually now got them down really small. So this is a really interesting group of hostas. These are called the mouse ears. And the first one came out about 20 years ago. And what happened is a fairly small hosta had a mutation, not a color mutation, but it had what we call a ploidy mutation. Typical hostas have two sets of chromosomes. This one had an accident when it was when the cells were reproducing and it doubled and it became what we call a tetraploid and or 
if we were real technically, there are also some annual ploids because when you tetraploid a plant, you double the chromosomes and you have three layers, you can have one layer that got doubled, two layers that got doubled, or three layers that got doubled. So you got all different kinds of ploidy changes. What that did, it caused the leaves to thicken. So feel the thickness of the leaf. And so compared to other hostas, the leaves are effectively double the thickness. Often flowers are actually double the size as well. So that was a really big breakthrough. What breeders have found now is they can actually do this intentionally. Uh, and the best way it turned out is to use the wrong amount of pre-emergent herbicide. And if you do that on a hosta, you, the people are actually doing it intentionally now. And you, when you do that, if it's a variegated plant, you double the width of the margin in addition to doubling the thickness of the leaf. So you're seeing a lot of uh, plants now that are what we call tetraploids. And that really gives a very different uh, feel. It, it loses some of the gracefulness. It becomes a lot more rigid. Same with daylilies. But it really is nice that you don't have things eat on it quite as bad, not including deer. They will eat on anything. And you can just see as we go through some of the different types. We looked earlier at some edge forms. These are center variegated forms. This is some more of the dwarf coming out of the mouse ears. So each of these was first, in that case, a cross, then a mutation, then another mutation. So this one had two mutations and a cross to get to where it is. So each host is a little different in how many things it's gone through to get to the point it is today. So anybody, I mean, I can drag y'all around. Any questions on hostas? I think I probably used up my 15 minutes. Yes? When's a good time to move one if you put in the wrong place? When's the best time to move one? Whenever you have a shovel in your hand. <laughs> there, there is not a bad time to move a hosta. I, I've moved them every week of the year. There's no difference. Just if you're going to move it, you need to be able to water it. And as long as you can do that, there is not a bad time. You know, you've you got as many different people writing about them. Somebody will tell you spring, some summer, some fall, some winter. It's irrelevant. So move them anytime. They move well. So you'd mentioned, I think, dry shade. Yes. Is that really yeah. more of a soil condition? Yes. Yeah, they do not like dry shade. They like moist soils. They can tolerate drought for a week or so, but you get a long extended drought, they will go backwards. The same as under deep shade. They hate deep shade. They can't stand it. They will absolutely shrink back. You often won't see it till the year later, but it just goes backwards. Now, hostas, after enough years, will develop a what we call a dead center. They actually grow so well that the center becomes woody and dies out. At that point, you can certainly divide it, and you can either go in and quarter it, or you can divide it down individually. Uh, if you do it individually, remember it'll take a little longer to come back, but you can easily get, you know, 50 to 100 plants out of one single clump. So do, as long as you have a root on it, you're absolutely good. It doesn't even need to be much of a root. I would generally, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be able to keep it watered, you don't need to reduce any foliage. If you can't keep it as watered, cut some of the foliage back and allow it not to suffer so much because every foliage you leave is gonna have to transpire moisture away. But the more foliage you leave, the faster the roots get reestablished. So you're better off leaving all the foliage on and watering more often other questions? Great questions. Yes? Some of these look like they're in full shade. Uh, full shade is where you don't see any dappled light. So here you're always seeing dappled light. We really, even if you look uh, over here, morning sun. It, it, it's dappled. Uh, that's east, correct, yes. So even back here you're seeing some dappled light. But what you're noticing now, this is under an evergreen. That's where you don't want to plant them. So this hosta, if this was out there, would be three times the size. So it definitely suffers being under an evergreen tree, because under an evergreen, you really don't get much light. What we've done in this case is we've raised the canopy. So we came in with our pole saw and we cut the limbs so that the light doesn't have to come through as many layers of limbs, because every layer of limbs that comes through, it reduces light. So if we had left the limbs down to here, those hostas would be almost nothing now. 
And hostas will recover. If you limb up a tree within four to six weeks, you'll see the hostas start to regrow. It's that fast. Uh, it, it's amazing how they uh, use light. Great question. The other big problem with hostas is voles. Uh, Voles are a problem. Uh, voles are actually, fortunately, very easy to control. It's just most people don't. Cats work, yes, if you, if you have a cat that likes voles. Uh, uh, the product Rosol is what we recommend. That's what is the, the most effective by far on, ro on voles. What you have to do is you must repeat it every two weeks as long as they're eating. So you cover it with a rock or a stone or a flower pot because they only eat where it's dark and dry. And then every two weeks you have to check it. If you don't do that, don't even bother putting it out. And every two weeks, and when once you finish, September comes, you start again. And you do that two years in a row, September, February to April. And if you do that, there will not be a vole on your property. It's, it's pretty close to 100% effective. R-O-Z-O-L. And what we like about it, it's very safe on non-target uh, species like cats and dogs, because there are a lot of rat baits you don't want to use around your pets. So I tell everybody, if there's a question, take a box, go to your vet, ask them, is it going to be a problem? Because we don't want to be poisoning any pets, but we've been using it for 30 years. We've never had an issue with any of our cats. Other questions? So a lot of lot of hostas out there right now. There's about 6,000 named varieties of hostas. Uh, there's about probably 600 of those that are actually unique that you can actually tell without a label. Uh, and those are good. You'll see quite a few as you walk around the garden. I, our collection's probably in the probably close to four or five hundred varieties now. But we've we've thrown away a lot. So for us, if they don't really look unique and aren't really excellent garden plants, we're just going to toss them because we're not collecting names. We just want really great plants. So there's a lot of neat, uh, lot of neat improvements. Like I say, a lot of fragrance. Uh, one of the things for us we've been working on is trying to put vigor in the dwarfs because early on all the dwarfs were dwarfed because they didn't grow. Well, that's not really what you want. So trying to put vigor has really been tough. But we've made some real neat breakthroughs. If you could see in the sale house, you'll see some of our little miniatures now that'll have, you know, 20 to 30 plants in a four inch pot. Wow. So really some good breakthroughs. The last big breakthrough for us has been branch flower scapes. We're trying to do what daylilies people did is get the four way branch in. And we have now got that in uh, one of ours that we've released and a couple more that are coming so that the flowers are actually attractive. Because generally hosta flowers look like a limp dish rag. They're generally not, not really attractive, but there are a few that we can work with to get uh, better plants. And you say there's no such thing as a deer proof hosta? No such thing as a deer proof hosta, no. Now th there will be, it's coming. It, it's, it's a matter of money uh, because uh, the technology is there. Now it has been for a few years to uh, inject the gene of capsicum, of pepper into a hosta and can make it completely deer resistant. It's just, I know a couple of folks are looking for some venture capital money right now to do that with. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.